Within the desolate and accursed domain of Brightwater, a town now twisted into a grotesque citadel of death, Villainer Everdark, once known as the Wizard Anovir, has fully embraced the forbidden path of Lichdom. A dark alchemy had granted him a terrible immortality, and he has seized control of the very essence of the dead, weaving a profane tapestry of undeath that drapes this land in shadows. News of Villainer's awakening had spread like a malignant plague, reaching the ears of valiant heroes such as yourselves who had embarked on the perilous quest to restore order and liberate Brightwater from the clutches of this abyssal lich. The quest was clear, locate Villainer's phylactery, the vessel that anchored his very soul, and destroy it with prejudice, severing the chains that bind him and his godless immortality to this realm. As you tread deeper into the heart of Villainer's obsidian tower, the air itself seemed to grow heavy, suffused with an ominous energy. The hallowed ground trembles beneath your feet as if the very earth rebels against your mission. Your senses hear and feel storm clouds gathering overhead, casting an eerie presence on your shadowed descent. Undeterred by these ominous signs, you press on, your steps echoing through the dimly lit darkened stone corridors. With each passing moment, your adversaries, Villainer's undead minions, grow more formidable, their ranks bolstered by the Lich's necromantic powers. Yet armed with your collective strength, might of the celestial gods, and renowned skill and prowess from years of vanquishing such evils, you remain undaunted, resolved to confront this abomination and end the Lich's rule of dread. As you near the lair entrance to Villainer's inner sanctum, a chill settles upon the air, permeating your very bones. The cavernous chamber lay open before you, its cold walls adorned with wretched sculptures and demonic symbols, each stone pulsating with a dark, otherworldly energy, their purpose unknown to you, but undoubtedly entwined with Villainer's dark pack with the abyssal plane. The rhythmic throbbing of the runic carvings reverberates in your ears, blending with the thunderous rumble of the storm above. A symphony of dread played upon your senses, heightening your apprehension. With cautious steps, you navigate the treacherous floor, slick with vile remnants of Villainer's dark arts, a visceral reminder of the abominations he had wrought and why he must be stopped forever. And then, as if appearing from the void, upon a precipice of dark stone, Villainer stood, his countenance a malignant fusion of malice and amusement. As his voice reaches your ears, a chilling smile graced his lips, revealing a trace of mirth and confidence in his eyes. With measured words, he taunts, eager to intake the souls of such renowned heroes, and reminding you of his own transformation from his mortal shackles, ominously assuring you that your fate would mirror his own, mostly. In the face of Villainer's arrogant proclamation, a void of nothingness loomed like a specter, fear tugged at the edges of your resolve, tempting you to yield, to succumb to the dread that Villainer embodied. But within each hero's heart a flicker of defiance remained, a flame that burned bright amidst the encroaching darkness. You draw your weapons and ready your spells, invoking the might of magic and steel, steadfast in your determination to defy the Lich's unholy prophecy. Steel yourself, heroes, for the abyss awaits, but your resolve, your strength, and your unwavering purpose may yet pierce the shroud of darkness and bring light back to this godless hollow. The battle that lay before you is the ultimate test of your collective will, an epic confrontation where victory means salvation for Brightwater and the end to the Lich's tyranny, and where defeat invites a dark, eternal servitude to the abyss. Welcome adventurers, I'm Rich, and this is Riches and Liches, dedicated to dungeons, dragons, and tales of lore. It has been a perilous journey, my friends, yet we have arrived. Nearly two hours of history and lore on the reviled and respected Lich are now behind us, and this is the final chapter, part five of our epic Lich Odyssey, or is it? 
More on that in a moment. Regardless, we find ourselves upon the Lich's Lair with all its mystique and awe-inspiring power. And today, we're going to provide a treatise on the Lair of the Lich. In our most recent volumes, we were really able to get our creative energies flowing through homebrewing, and that's not going to change now. In fact, that is the primary focus of this final volume. Layers and the associated layer actions, they're a world builder's dream, and this volume aims to help you create the ultimate layer for your next epic Lich encounter. But I did want to share a thought that I had. Most of you know by now, or at least you should, that I'm very community driven. Every subscriber has a voice here, and I love the interaction. I get really happy with the polls. <laughs> so I was planning out the best way to wrap up this series, and I had several ideas, but I kept coming back to what I would like to see as a world builder or even as a player. And that was to depart from the normal lich mold, to create something unique. I want to provide each of you a range of creative Lich variants, custom layers and layer actions, and even some backstories, all with a lot of homebrew to tie it all together. Then I realized that to actually do that, to compile all the variants I have in my mind and in my homebrew tome, aka the Walmart binder, would really be impossible to do in a single volume. There's just far too many, which is a good thing, but it was then that I had kind of a minor eureka moment. I was already a bit sad that our Lich series was coming to an end, so I thought, since we now have the foundation for the Lich well established, all of the lore, all of the history, now's a great time to go forward with full homebrew. Why not create a series of ongoing videos, each dedicated to homebrewing a particular and specific Lich variant, even with your input? That would include a detailed layer, the layer actions, some phylactery types that are related to the variant theme, and even a backstory that you can use directly or as inspiration for your own creation. Now, honestly, I'm not sure if this is even something you'd like to see as an ongoing series, so let me know down in the comments. And if you're listening to this video, then there's a poll in the community tab asking you that very question. Is that something you'd like to see? But for Volume 5, starting in Chapter 3, I want to give you an idea of what those future volumes might look like. So today I'll use that same proposed format to finish what we started in Volume 4 and complete our Druidic Lich. Before we get started though, in the realm of YouTube, likes and subscriptions are like potions of success. They allow me to produce more content for you for years to come. So drink up and press the like and subscribe to join our community of lore historians. Doing so really does help with the RNG dice roll that is the YouTube algorithm. Thank you very much. I have had so much fun creating this series for you and liches, they're the namesake of the channel. So I do hope we can find a way to continue the series, but doing so in a way that you'll find both meaningful and enjoyable. Okay, and now I present the conclusion to our lich series. Volume 5. In the world of RPG and dark fantasy, the Lair of the Lich is a place of unspeakable horrors and malevolent magic. It's a place where the boundaries between life and death are blurred and where the very air is thick with the foul, acrid stench of brimstone and decay. This unholy bastion that the Lich calls home should always be a place of ominous dread, where the all-inspiring power of the Lich is most potent and can tangibly be felt, emanating from the very walls that surround. For it is here that the undead sorcerer wields his dark magic, unleashing curses and plagues upon the living, and it's also a place of grave secrets. The Lich guards his knowledge jealously, hoarding it like a dragon hoards its treasure. So let us start this discussion with two core tenets that are, to me anyway, essential for dungeon masters wielding a lich and for all high level adventurers, at least those that have any business near a lich's lair. One, the lich in his lair is far more deadly. The lair action mechanics in 5th edition as well as similar mechanics in other variant systems are one of the primary reasons for this increased power and facing a lich in his lair should always be an exponentially more deadly and, not to be overlooked, far more complex encounter. 
and this should be communicated to any party planning to tread there, and not just in the moments before they breach the entrance. No, any DM whose ultimate goal is to have both a memorable and positive experience for the party, win or lose, will be communicating this fact through NPCs and many other plot devices early and often. I really can't stress this enough. Make the information overwhelming so the party both fully understands the increased dread that awaits them and also gives them ample opportunity to really think through any potential encounter plans or ideas that they might have. And two, somewhat anathema to those very plans, is a lich will only rarely leave his lair. Selfish to the core, but supremely intelligent, the lich cannot be easily tricked, lured, or goaded away from what is the center of their power, and also likely, or at least very plausibly, the protector of their phylactery. Now, that's not to say as a DM that you should just flat refuse to let your lich be lured out, but I would make sure it only does so as a reward to your party for devising a compelling and or elaborate plan to do so. I have touched on the important fundamentals of lair design in previous volumes, but it's worth reiterating and even expanding upon now as you begin to actually build a lich lair. To construct an epic lair for your lich, here are a few guidelines that I always follow when building lairs of really any type. I use them as a framework for any homebrew customization or even a standard out of the box encounter if it's going to take place in a lair. Number one, we start with the lair construction or location itself. This is far more important than I think many believe. It's not only the basis for building a challenging and memorable encounter, but it's also our first opportunity to start to create something imaginative and different, breaking that mold as I mentioned. To me, the layer rarely, if ever, should be that 20 by 20 standard cubed room that you lifted from a generic dungeon map. In fact, even if I'm running a pre-made module, I often add my own homebrew spin to the lair if one is present, making it my own, being mindful, of course, of balance. If the pre-made is perfectly tuned, then I just add some exciting elements or mechanics to make the encounter more enjoyable and memorable to my players. Remember, your lair actions are, generally speaking, there can be exceptions, but generally the lair actions are directly attributed to the lair. So be creative with the architecture and the design layout so that they match your intent and make sure that they make sense both thematically and most importantly, strategically. Take some time to walk through how an encounter inside your lair might actually play out. Consider the options that are available to your lich and how you would react in certain situations. For example, unless you're creating a homebrew lich variant that excels in melee combat, then your lich likely wants to use magic and movement and minions to do his fighting while keeping his distance. If you're planning to summon a horde of undead as your front line wall, then is the layout of your lair built to accommodate such a summoning? Taking the time to think through how the lich will actually use his lair is a critical step in designing one that gives the lich the home field advantage that is, for all intents and purposes, one of the primary benefits of having a lair. If the lair actively works against the lich, or even worse, helps the party, then its design is flawed and should be reconsidered. And speaking of strategic elements, a good lich lair should always have at least one hidden or additional exit where the lich can make his escape alternatively to using his magic. The lich is a genius level creature, a mighty foe that is likely more intelligent than any player in the party. And to me, it seems very illogical. And in fact, a rather elementary mistake that such a genius level enemy would create a lair that could in fact trap him, be his own dead end. It's just not likely. Leave those rookie mistakes to the orc and ogre warlords or the random hill giant. The lair should also have elevation, line of sight obstacles, and perhaps consist of multiple chambers. It should contain ingenious traps of both the arcane and mechanical variety. And finally, and this one is especially important to set your lair apart, the lair creation in and of itself should be designed with the same care and thought as the most important facets or set pieces of your overall campaign or adventure. You do this in order to really set the stage for what should always be 
the highlight of a campaign. My second guideline is another often overlooked facet of the Lich's Lair, and really this can apply to many final or high level encounters, and that's flavor. As a player who has spent days, weeks, months, heck, maybe even years of real time in a campaign, and then reach this penultimate encounter, the last thing you want to hear from a dungeon master is, okay, you've entered the Lich's Crypt, he looks up, he laughs, and begins to cast a spell roll for initiative. I mean, what a letdown that would be. A tragedy, in my opinion. Yeah, and just to get ahead of the comments, <laughs> no, it was not lost on me that that is basically the way the story intro to this volume went. But <laughs> that story, that's not an encounter, so that's a testament of what not to do. Okay, yeah, and, and I got to say this. I completely understand that sometimes the little things take almost as much time as designing the big stuff. I get it, I really do. I mean, that's why services like Describe have a market. They're not a sponsor, and I personally don't even use the service because the writing is the part that I enjoy most, so no testimony here to their quality. But I do get the appeal, it saves time. And if that is what you wanna do, then that's 100% acceptable. However, I do have a tip to share, also not a sponsor, but I can and will endorse. One of the greatest resources I've found to help me personally to save time on that little stuff, that still important little details, is a third party supplement called the Dread Thing Onomicon by Raging Swan Press. I absolutely adore this 500 page tome. Yeah, you heard that right, 476 pages, all dedicated to the little stuff all the finer details that normally take a lot of creative brain processing. But it's those little details, the dressing, if you will, that when done right, really make your encounter stand out and feel unique. And if it's not done or not done well, it kind of leaves the encounter flat. But whatever method you choose, don't underestimate the power of good flavor text and adventure dressing. It really serves to lift your encounters and discoveries right off the paper and into the imagination of your players. My third and final guideline is a simple concept to understand yet can be difficult in its implementation, and that's one of balance. I've made it very clear that a lit should be far more deadly in its lair, and I have also stressed that players should be well informed early in your campaign about that fact. But as you design your lair and its lair actions, keep in mind that nearly anything you do to enhance the lair will have an impact on balance, and you should always be mindful of that type of influence, its weight on any of the encounters. The basic bone stock 5e lich has a challenge rating of 21. That sounds pretty tough in and of itself, but to say the challenge rating system in 5e is not an exact science is a massive understatement. I mean, it's better than nothing, but every DM in the range of my voice right now is likely nodding and or recalling a prime example of the system's limitations and inaccuracies really affecting an encounter at their table. And most would agree that the higher level the encounter, the more prone to inaccuracy the system becomes. But even with that said, it's important that any world builder realize and constantly be mindful that it's not just enhanced damage or defensive changes that must be considered. Adding rough terrain, increasing lich movement speed or their movement abilities, even the elevation and line of sight changes, all these and even other minor effects can have a profound impact on balance. So try to keep that in mind as you do your world building. If you try and keep these three guidelines in mind as you're designing your next layer, I think you'll find them useful in ensuring that you create a fun and challenging encounter for your table. Okay, as I mentioned in the open, here we will finish off the Druid Lich we started in Volume 4. And if you'd like to see future volumes dedicated to different homebrew Lich variants, do let me know in the comments. And don't Get to check out that poll. We will do this by giving our Druid Lich variant a name, a lair, and some lair actions, as well as a backstory to tie it all together. So I'm calling my variant the Oaken Lich of the Dread Grove. Born from the unholy union of a powerful druid and the dark magic of abyssal undeath, this 
dark nature lich abomination melds the forces of necromancy and nature, wielding twisted druidic spells alongside the dark powers of a lich. So let's talk about layers. While my druid lich makes its lair in a dark, thorny grove deep within a forest, here are a few alternative layers you might consider or that might inspire you to make your own lair creations. The lich could layer in a petrified marsh, a desolate marshland dotted with ancient petrified trees, their skeletal forms standing like silent guardians. The dark, stagnant waters tainted with necrotic energy could damage or even grapple trespassers, while the oaken lich harnesses the corrupted life force of the marsh to fuel its powers. Maybe you'd prefer an underground lair. How about some arboreal catacombs or a massive root system within a giant dead tree? Either of these creating a network of underground tunnels and rooms perhaps illuminated by the eerie glow of bioluminescent fungi. This subterranean lair would conceal shadowy chambers where the oaken lich conducts forbidden rituals and experiments. I'd provide hints to the twisted undead forest creatures that have been malformed under this druidic lich's vile and dark powers. Perhaps he now has the ability to summon undead and diseased lions, tigers, or bears. Oh my indeed. Or if you really wanted to go deep underground, your druid lich could lair in an abyssal grotto, a deep underwater cavern that's accessed only through treacherous underwater passages. These are just a few ideas for lairs that will hopefully spawn some of your own creations, and if they do, please share. Now, let's discuss some lair actions. A lair is in many ways defined by its lair actions, so for our druid lich, I've created a few lair actions for you to consider. I'd recommend using no more than two and to follow 5e rules for lair actions, also ensuring your damage and effects are tuned properly for your intended encounter. First up, the Mists of Desolation. The lair fills with a thick, oppressive mist. It obscures vision and distorts sound. Within this supernatural fog, shadows seem to lurk. Malevolent spirits whisper ominous secrets, sowing seeds of doubt and fear. This description really hints at and allows the lair to provide a myriad of different effects and communicates those to the player. Just another example of how important flavored text is. The sound distortion could cause a percentage chance for any verbal spells to fail, or the whispers could cause disadvantage on any concentration checks, or maybe the fear effect, and then the fog could cause penalties on any sight related abilities or spells. And while I would definitely not impose all of these on the party at once, you could certainly rotate them, but it's a good example of how important flavor text is and how it communicates to the party what might be in store for them. Next up, Decay's Rebirth. I like this one to go with the lair descriptions hinting at dark experiments that are going on within the lair, giving the party a clue at what might actually be in store for them as well. The lair has the power to reanimate fallen creatures, turning them into mindless undead servants of the lich. So in addition to rising forest creatures, any slain intruders, including those of the party, might find themselves rising again as soulless minions forced to turn against their former companions. And my final lair action is called Abyssal Veil. The lair becomes entangled within the plane of the abyss, blurring the boundaries between the material plane and the chaotic realm. Tendrils of abyssal energy reach out to ensnare intruders, threatening to drag them into the depths of an infinite abyss. This could result in a simple grapple to slow the players down or even add some necrotic damage to the effect. Or if you really needed this to be more powerful, the Abyssal Rift could have a low percentage chance to spawn low-level demons into the fray. Although, if I did this, I would have an equal chance that the demon might also attack the Lich itself. But you're not limited to the Abyssal effect. Depending upon the specifics of your Druid Lich, its theme, this veil could interact with any of the planes for a very different effect. Perhaps Pandemonium, where the plane's infamous, desperate howling winds carry terrified screams that could deafen you in seconds. 
Really, any of the planes become fair game here and is just a cornucopia of different effects that are at your disposal. Now, as we move on to phylacteries, if you have some unique homebrew lair actions, please share. I love reading them. For my druidic lich, his phylactery is a cursed relic of Shantia, taking a new dark form. The symbol, once an object of reverence dedicated to the goddess of nature, it's now been perverted by dark rituals, becoming an abomination that channels the lich's power and holds his immortal soul. Here are a few other potential phylacteries for your druid lich. How about a haunted dream catcher? The phylactery takes the form of an unholy dream catcher dedicated to Orcus. It is adorned with ethereal strands. Trapped within its web are the restless souls of those who have fallen victim to the lich's malevolence in the past. The phylactery could take the form of a necrotic totem carved from the bones of the lich's first soul it captured. It is covered in desiccated flesh and inscribed with dark runes. It emanates a palpable aura of death and corruption. And finally, my personal favorite, how about a petrified flower, like a black orchid? Petrified, it is now hard as stone and black, yet it radiates a faint glow from the flower bud and its petals. The bud holds the lich's soul, and each petal holds the last breath of any creature with a soul that was slain by the lich. Its life force now trapped within those petals and continuing to fuel the lich's immortality. You could even take it a step further and give the lich powers based upon the mortal abilities of the souls captured in the petals. But again, I urge caution to ensure proper balance, but it could make for a really fun and diverse encounter. And finally, as we close out volume five, a good lich, or any villain for that matter, requires a unique backstory, not only to provide the flavor I've been talking about in this volume, but also seed clues and hints to potential weaknesses or provide insight to the goals and motivations that drive the lich. A good backstory, one that is compelling and delivered in such a way that highlights to the players its importance will really help to engage the party. But my advice would be not to provide this as whole cloth to the party. Instead, write it in full as I have and will share in a moment. And then when you read it back to yourself, grab a half dozen important points or facts and seed those throughout your campaign. Rumors given from an NPC, a torn page from an ancient text as a quest reward or otherwise seeded by the DM as needed. In any event, here's the following backstory that I wrote for my lich. Aquilus Derrico, a druid, a lifelong lover of nature and once devout worshiper of Shantia, one day found his faith tested to its limits as he witnessed the relentless advance of a burgeoning kingdom. The kingdom's insatiable hunger for expansion, coupled with their wanton pollution and unrelenting deforestation, threatened to consume the very essence of the natural world that Aquilus held dear. His prayers sent skyward remained unanswered, and his pleas for intervention fell upon the deaf divine ear. Driven to desperation, Aquilus made a fateful decision, one that would forever sever his ties to the purity of his former faith. Recognizing that his own mortality loomed, the aging druid resolved to grasp onto power by any means necessary. In the depths of his solitude, he delved into forbidden texts and esoteric lore, seeking the forbidden knowledge that could grant him the immortality and strength he craved. It was during these dark days that Orcus, the demon prince of undeath, cast his nefarious gaze upon Aquilus. Sensing the despair and vulnerability that simmered within the druid's soul, Orcus whispered insidious promises and sowed seeds of corruption within the druid's heart and mind. A pact was then struck and sealed in blood, unlocking the unholy secrets of lichdom. Thus, Aquila surrendered himself to the abyssal chaos of Orcus, willingly embracing the chaotic path of the lich. And that concludes Volume 5, my friends. Would you like to see more homebrew lich variants in dedicated future volumes? If so, let me know in the comments and be sure to vote in the poll up in the community tab right now. 
please consider following on Twitter at Riches and Liches, checking out our Patreon, Discord, YouTube channel memberships for as little as two bucks, or a super thanks, the equivalent of buying that bar to drink at the local tavern for a tale well told. And if you feel like I earned it, sub and ring that bell to help me conquer my own big bad evil guy, the YouTube algorithm. Thanks for listening, and until next time, remember, the only limitation at your table is your imagination.